Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, we're going to talk about dangling participles. But first, it's graduation season, so if you know someone who's graduating soon, here's a great gift you might be able to win for them. My podcast network, Quick and Dirty Tips, is running a sweepstakes. The lucky winners will receive an amazing bundle of books perfect for a new graduate, like a cookbook full of simple, healthy recipes, an inspiring essay collection full of advice for surviving your first year after college, and more. Enter for your chance to win at bit.ly slash QDT Life After College. Good luck. When I meet people and they hear that I'm Grammar Girl, it's not uncommon for them to say something like, no dangling participles, am I right? But I get the sense that while dangling participles are something they vaguely remember they're supposed to avoid, they don't remember what they actually are. It's more of a knee-jerk, oh my gosh, I remember this one grammar thing and I'm going to blurt it out, rather than shared solidarity. So before we talk about what it means to dangle a participle, we have to answer the question, what is a participle? It's a tough question because participles have a few different jobs. Today, we're only going to talk about their job that makes them look like adjectives. They tell you more about the noun that follows. Participles can be in the present tense or the past tense, and the present participle always ends with ing. For example, dream is a verb, and dreaming is its present participle. Speed is a verb, and speeding is its present participle. To use the verb, you could say, he will speed on the freeway. Speed is an action, a verb. To use speeding as an adjective-like participle, you could say, follow that speeding car. Speeding acts something like an adjective modifying the noun car. It tells you what the car is doing, what kind of car it is, a speeding car. Here's another example. Hike is a verb, and hiking is the present participle. To use the verb, you could say, let's hike the trail. To use the participle, you could say, wait for the hiking campers to get back. Hiking, the participle, tells you what the campers are doing, what kind of campers they are. They're hiking campers. Participles have another role, too. They help form the perfect and progressive verb tenses, but we won't talk about those today. So now I trust that you understand how to use verbs and their participles. But to understand dangling participles, we need to talk about participial phrases. These are just phrases that contain a participle and modify the subject of the sentence. They can include words besides the participle, such as prepositions, pronouns, and nouns. But for now, we'll just focus on the idea that they contain a participle like speeding or hiking. The way they modify the subject isn't as straightforward as a single adjective modifying a single noun, but the participial phrase is still modifying a noun or noun phrase, the subject. Here's some examples to help make it more clear. Floating in the pool, I marveled at the clouds. Floating in the pool is the participial phrase that modifies the subject, I. Floating is the participle in the phrase floating in the pool. It describes what I'm doing. Here's another one. Biting his victim, the vampire felt a momentary thrill. Biting his victim is the participial phrase that modifies the subject, the vampire. Biting is the participle in the phrase, biting his victim. It describes what the vampire's doing. And one last example. Beating you over the head with examples, I hope to make you understand participial phrases. Beating you over the head with examples is the participial phrase modifying the subject I. Beating is the participle in the phrase beating you over the head with examples. It describes what I'm doing. In all three of those examples, the subject that was being modified by the participial phrase came right after the phrase. It was sticking close to the modifier so you couldn't miss it. The participial phrase doesn't have to be at the beginning of a sentence, but that's the place where it's most likely to dangle, so we'll stick with that format today. And now, we're ready to learn about dangling participles, because when you dangle a participle, it means your participial phrase is hanging there and your sentence 
with no proper subject in sight. They hate that as much as you hate it when a friend stands you up for lunch. Here's an example. Hiking the trail, the birds chirped loudly. The birds are the only subject in the sentence, and they directly follow the participial phrase. So the participial phrase has to grab onto something, so it grabs the only subject, the birds. So what that sentence says is that the birds were hiking the trail, and that's probably not what I mean. There was probably somebody hiking the trail and hearing the birds chirping loudly. So here's the dangler again. Hiking the trail, the birds chirped loudly. We can fix it by adding a proper subject right after the participial phrase. Hiking the trail, Squiggly and Aardvark heard the birds chirp loudly. Now, hiking the trail modifies Squiggly and Aardvark, as it should, because they are the subject. They're the ones hiking the trail. Here's another dangling modifier. Wishing I could sing, the high notes seemed to taunt me. Did you hear the problem? The high notes are the only subject in the sentence, so the participial phrase, wishing I could sing, attaches to that noun because it doesn't want to dangle. That makes a sentence that says the high notes wish I could sing. If they were capable of wishing, they might wish I could sing, but what I'm really trying to say in that sentence is wishing I could sing, I feel taunted by the high notes. In that sentence, wishing I could sing correctly modifies the subject I, and it makes a lot more sense than imagining cringing high notes. So to sum up, a dangling participle modifies the wrong noun. Usually, you've left the subject implied and are taking for granted that your reader will know what you mean, which is generally not a good writing strategy. You fix a dangling modifier by putting the proper subject in the sentence usually right after the participle or participial phrase. To finish today, I have a familect story from Don. Hi, Grammar Girl. This is Don from Boardman, Ohio, and I have a unique uh, phrase that my family uses for your familect. Several years ago, we were taking a family trip all the way to Yellowstone National Park. We were very excited to see the wildlife there in addition to the geysers, and we were looking forward to seeing the bison and the elk and the bear. And so when we first were driving through the park, we would see these deer, and we, they looked a little bit unusual, so we looked them up. They were called mule deer. And as we kept driving, we kept seeing more of these mule deer instead of the bison and the bear. And so eventually, we became up with the phrase, we'd get all excited, we'd see something, we'd say, oh, just a mule deer. And so that eventually just became a family saying, whereas anytime we got excited over something and it didn't really pan out to be that great, we now just say, just a mule deer. So that's our little funny family familec. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Don. One thing I've noticed is that some of the stories are starting to fall into categories. If you remember, well, it's not a chocolate river from a few weeks ago, this one is similar. People take one unexpectedly disappointing experience and use it in a more generalized way. I have three or four stories now that fall into a different category that I'm saving up to use all together in one show about the whole topic, too. How's that for a teaser? If you'd like to share your Familect story, you can leave a voicemail at 833214-GIRL, and you might hear it on the show. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl, an author of seven books, including the New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. And thanks to my audio producer, Nathan Sims. This show is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network, and you can find articles that go with each episode at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.